Okay, I think we can get started. Uh, my name is Michael Dobbs. I'm a historian with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, prior to joining the museum, I was a journalist for the Washington Post. Um, I've written several history books, and uh, I became interested in the subject of the film uh, because I worked on an exhibit at the museum called Americans and the Holocaust, um, which is about America's response to the rise of Nazism. And we think of the Holocaust as a German story and German responsibility, Nazi responsibility, and of course that's true, but there's also an American dimension to the story, uh, particularly the question of whether and to what extent uh, refugees seeking to escape Nazi Germany were admitted to the United States, and then later the question of rescue. And uh, those are the topics that we examine in our special exhibit, Americans and the Holocaust. And uh, in addition to working on that exhibit, I also wrote a book called The Unwanted, America, Auschwitz, and the Village Caught in Between, um, which is about a Jewish community in a single a uh, village in uh, the Baden region of southwest Germany, and it describes how the Jews of Kippenheim uh, were attempting to flee Germany and to uh, enter a foreign country, primarily the United States. And some of them made it, and others didn't make it. And my book weaves in the story of what happened to the uh, Jews of Kippenheim and whether or not they succeeded in reaching the United States or some other place of refuge with the story of what was happening in the US at the time. There was a political struggle going on between people who wanted to admit refugees and people who didn't. So the Kwanzaa story that you've just seen is a small slice of that larger story. Um, I write about the Kwanzaa in my book, and um, I describe uh, what was going on within the United States government, the arguments between Breckenridge Long and Patrick Marlin that you heard about in the movie, the role of Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, and I also describe uh, the, uh, what it was like to be on the ship. Um, I think the film is very comprehensive. Um, there's one... Uh, uh, sidelight that um, uh, you uh, might have appreciate. Uh, I guess that many people in this audience have seen the movie Casablanca. Yeah. Um, well, in the movie, uh, there's uh, uh, two actors. One, Marcel uh, Dalio, a French actor, and his wife, Madeleine Le Beau. In There's a very famous movie, scene in the movie of singing the Marseillaise. And uh, tears come down the, uh, the uh, face of uh, this French nightclub uh, singer, Madeleine Le Beau, uh, who was actually on the Kwanzaa with her husband, Marcel Delieu. So among all these passengers, there were two people who later became very celebrated, uh, an actor and a wife. So I thought I would just uh, read uh, I, during, when I did the research for my book, I read uh, Marcel Dalio's autobiography, and he talks about uh, uh, the events on the Kwanzaa. So I thought I might just read that particular paragraph to you. Um, the impounding of the ship gave new hope to the despairing passengers. Just a few minutes earlier, it looked as if they would be sent back to Nazi-dominated Europe. Now they had a chance for a new life. We laugh, we weep, we cannot believe it. We want to kiss the attorney, noted the French Jewish actor Marcel Dalio, who had fled Paris ahead of the German invasion. It seems to me that an enormous Bible has appeared in the heavens, behind which stands God, who has just winked at me. Um, so Olivia Mattis talked about the miracles involved in the Kwanzaa, 
and uh, to the people who were let off the boat, this indeed seemed like a miracle. And it was a miracle to which a number of people had contributed. Of course, the lawyer, Jacob Norovitz, um, the consul in Bordeaux, the Portuguese consul, uh, Susan Mendes, who issued many of the visas, the original visas, that uh, uh, the, allowed the uh, Kwanzaa passengers to leave Europe. And uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who argued uh, with her husband and with other members of the US government that the, uh, something should be done um, for the refugees. So it took uh, the contribution of many people, particularly those three individuals, to accomplish this um, miracle of uh, granting refuge to the Kwanzaa passengers. So we have a very uh, distinguished panel um, to talk about the movie and about the Kwanzaa. Uh, including two people who were actually involved with the, um, uh, with the ship. First, on my left, Annette Luckman, um, who you saw in the movie. She was the little girl... Right there, behind you. Is that right there, behind you? <laughs> in the... Uh, with her sister and her mother uh, in New York, when they, uh, it's described in the movie how their father was allowed to greet them in New York, that he wasn't actually allowed to, to touch his daughters. He was only allowed to greet them through the porthole. Um, so Annette will talk about, she was one of the youngest passengers on board the ship actually, but she will talk about her, how her family tried to escape Europe and the obstacles in their path. Um, then right on my left is Kathy Rand, um, who is the daughter of uh, Wolf Rand, uh, who was one of the passengers, uh, another passenger on the Kwanzaa. And his significance was that it was actually his family that engaged the lawyer, Jacob Morowitz, um, to um, uh, issue or to block the departure of the Kwanzaa by any means possible. And the difference between Jacob Morowitz and the, there were lots of lawyers who were working on this case, um, but uh, it was Jacob Morowitz who had the idea of impounding the ship through this very obscure legal mechanism called libel from the French libel. Um, the other lawyers brought habeas corpus suits on behalf of their clients which were thrown out of court. But Jacob Morowitz has understood maritime law, and he uh, filed a breach of contra contract suit, which was known as a libel suit, which um, there wasn't actually much basis for the suit. It was later thrown out. But it was sufficient to delay the departure of the Kwanzaa for three, and th three days, uh, which uh, allowed the people who wanted to get the refugees off the ship time enough to organize. That was Moravitz's contribution, and it was Kathy's family that engaged Moravitz. Um, so you've met um, Laura, um, the filmmaker, Laura Seltzer Dooney, um, who worked for a long time for PBS and um, founded her own film and video company. And on my immediate right is Blanche Vieson Cook, um, probably the world's, not probably, undoubtedly, the world's leading expert on Eleanor Roosevelt. She's written, just completed, three volume history, uh, biography of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, I looked at, she now, she's a um, distinguished professor at uh, CUNY in New York, I looked up their website and I looked up the research in, uh, interests of Blanche, which are women's history, um, US international policy, war, peace, and imperialism. <laughs> so lots of big subjects. Uh, so um, before turning to, to Blanche, I just want to um, perhaps ask uh, Annette, Okay, so with this photograph behind us, can you 
describe the circumstances in which it was taken. Of course, you were only three years old at the time, but tell us a little more about this photograph and how you eventually managed to, what had happened to your father and how you were eventually reunited. Well, my father had left uh, before we, before we left. He, he left a few months before uh, Antwerp was bombed. And in order to um, get work, and I, you could, I, I mentioned that in the film. And, um, also, um, so we, uh, we, we had to get out of Antwerp. It was very difficult to get out of Antwerp at the time because we didn't have a car and nobody knew how to drive anyway. So um, my aunt, there were three of us. In the picture, you just you saw the three of us. It was my mother, my sister, and there was my aunt in there too, I think, in one of the pictures there. Uh, she was very charming, and she charmed two men in cars and, and who knew how to drive to take us on the way to, uh, to escape out of, uh, it was the beginning of our exodus. From and Belgium. From, from Antwerp. Yeah. And um, on the way, we, of course, we joined some of the refugees after they left us off. And, and it was at that point that my mother, when they were bombing, my mother dove into a ditch and covered me with her body. And I was glued to her. I could not be separated from her. So uh, we ended up in a farmhouse near Boulogne, where we were hiding and some British soldiers came and they said, well, you know, we can take you over the um, English Channel. Um, my mother thought, oh my God, a rocky boat, a, a road boat, they're gonna take us across the channel? No way. So, so we didn't do that. Then the Germans came and they were very polite. They didn't threaten us. They just said, you've got to go back to your place of origin. So we went back to Antwerp, and from there, we got you know, visas to, to Mexico through the Italian fascists. <coughs> and that was, uh, and as for the picture. But was your family given a, a visa by Sousa Mendes or, or no, somebody else? No, no, we got it from the Italian consulate. Right. It was, and so the first stop on the Kwanzaa, we, we got to the Kwanzaa finally, uh, was, um, New York, and it was there that the picture was taken of my father reaching up because he could not board the ship. And I was lowered uh, in, by, in a chair with uh, tied to pulleys, and I was screaming all the way down. I, I thought I would fall in the water. And, um, and my father hugged me, and he gave me this beautiful doll. And I took it back on the ship, and I played with it, and then some little girl comes along and throws it in the water. <laughs> so my, you know, my, uh, my mother got so furious, she, she put her on her knee and she spanked her. I was so glad to see that. <laughs> so that was... <laughs> okay, so the, the sequence is that the ship first comes to New York, uh, where the people who had U.S. visas were allowed to get off, but they didn't include Annette's family. So Annette, with other passengers on board the ship that taken to Mexico, uh, were some people who were allowed to get off, but most of the visas, uh, people are refused because the Mexicans say their visas are no longer valid or invalid. And then they come back up the coast to, uh, to Norfolk, Virginia, and on the way, they sent a telegram to uh, Eleanor Roosevelt saying there are 83 women and children, uh, uh, Jews fleeing Europe. Uh, will you please help? Um, so before I go to Blanche, to um, uh, Kathy, um, why was it that your family hired this man called Jacob Morowitz to intervene in the case? Um. To the best of my knowledge, um, my father, who was contacting anybody and everybody, he contacted a business associate 
uh, unnamed in New York, amongst other people. And that business associate in New York was the one who recommended Jacob Marwitz. And I have no idea why, or how he knew them, or who this person was uh, in New York who was, you know, uh, was just a business associate. Your father was already in New York? No, no, no. Uh, My yeah. father was on the Kwanzaa. Uh, oh, right. But oh, he, his business associates? His business associates, mostly his brothers. Right. He had a number of brothers and a couple, again, the story is, is very murky and lost in, in history, but he, I believe, had a couple of brothers who had come much earlier and were older than he. And um, uh, so he must have just, they must have had business associates. Um, I think know. somebody mentioned in the film, you know, money played a role. You had to have money, A, to get on the boat, and then you had to have money to buy all these lawyers, and it was not that you know, they, people were incredibly well off, but they had to have resources or connections in order to get, the, get on the boat in the first place, hire the lawyers later. And was your family reasonably well, well off? Or? Not exactly that I know of, but um, my father's brothers possibly had already established themselves a little bit um, in New York. And the only thing I do know is that my father had a gold watch, which from what I understand, he used to barter on several occasions back and forth. And I do have the watch now, so ultimately he did get it back. But uh, he did use this gold watch. Okay, so let's look at the role of uh, one of the uh, people who have been described as uh, individuals who really made a difference in this story. There was Jacob Morowitz, there was uh, Susan Mendes, and there was uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, so the passengers, first of all, they know that Eleanor is sympathetic to their cause. That's why they sent her a telegram from the ship. Um, and then Eleanor at the time is in Hyde Park with her husband um, when the telegram arrives. So perhaps Blanche can explain, A, why was Eleanor so passionate about refugees? And B, what do you think happened when this telegram arrived? First of all, I just want to thank you so much for this film. I'm so moved to be here. Uh, this is such a, you know, the unwanted. And just the context. The silence that greeted the information that was coming out of Europe, and in my research, and I'm sure in your research, it's clear that the disaster, the massacres, the roundups, the end of Jewish communities in Europe was known. Every little bit of it was known by the Roosevelts and by members of the State Department and by people who could have made a difference. And the silence was resounding. The political framework is really important here, which is um, all over the world. In Australia, for example, there's recently been a book, One is Too Many. We don't want any refugees. In the United States, at the time of the beginning of the war, before the war happened, by about 1938, there were already 60 anti-alien bills. We do not want any refugees here. We don't want any aliens here. We don't want any immigrants here. We don't want them who are they. And then you look at people like Breckenridge Long, and we had a conversation, you don't want me to focus on Breckenridge Long, I have no idea why not. Because he represents the mood of all these right wing or fascist, I think it's true to say, fascist American political leaders who don't want any immigrants. He says they're all going to be Nazi spies or communist infiltrators. And this is part of why the isolationists were so powerful. It is why there was, you know, the New Deal is very limited. It's segregated. 
And so Eleanor Roosevelt is really an amazing visionary, and I do hope everybody who cares about the unwanted will look at volume three, because Eleanor Roosevelt, her, her great contribution, I think, is she puts it all together. We will have peace when everybody has education, when everybody has access to a job, to creativity, to security, to housing, to health care. We will have And this is true for the US, but it's true for the world. And she puts it all together. And her ability to put it all together, I mean, the US is segregated. FDR's Democratic Party is the Dixiecrat Party. Why doesn't he say a word? Why doesn't he fire Breckenridge Long? Why doesn't he integrate the military? Because the Dixiecrats rule. It's like, you know, Moscow Ninja. <laughs> 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 Well, let's talk about when we talk about when you respond later. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to prevent you from talking about when you respond, but let's talk about Eleanor to begin with. Um, you know, why was she particularly interested in refugees? I mean, if she had lots of causes that she could embrace, and she did over the course of her lifetime. But in 1940, she made refugees her particular passion. Why was that? Well, they're not her particular passion, but it's on a continuum. And when, I mean, when Bill Wilkie is running for president uh, in 1940, he brings race up to the very beginning of, the, of his agenda, the forefront of his agenda. And then he, you know, he and FDR become friends. He goes on a world tour and he has an epiphany. Everything that happens anywhere affects everybody, everywhere. We are all connected, one world. Eleanor Roosevelt was writing things like that by about 1934. And her understanding that can it happen here, can fascism happen here, was yes. And we have to build barriers against it. The best road to fascism, she says in 1934 or 35, is the end of public education. UN public education, you can have tyranny. 19, I mean, so she puts it all together and she puts it together immediately. When the SS St. Louis is sent back, Eleanor Roosevelt vows this will never happen again. And she does say when the Kwanzaa is in dock, everybody on that boat can be my guest. And she gets Patrick Murphy Mallon mm -hmm. to get there. And okay. because he is her out, and there's that political right. committee for refugees, and she's working with that committee. Okay, so explain, they're both at Hyde Park, and actually there's a photograph of the two of them at Hyde Park with a little dog. What was the dog's name? Carlo. Uh, right. There's Fowler. the famous Scotty. picture. Okay, so then <laughs> this, te like this telegram Fowler. arrives from the uh, passengers of the Kwanzaa, saying, please help us. Uh, what does she do and what's her, what is she, you think she's telling her husband? What's the debate around the Roosevelt um, kitchen table when this arrives? Well, I think she says, can't we help them? Their lives are at stake. Mm -hmm. And he says, essentially, it's 1940 and there's an election coming up. Be quiet <laughs> and don't talk about it. And, and she said, no, no, we have to help them. And she makes her call to her teammate. You know, never go anywhere without your gang. Roosevelt's <laughs> <laughs> into the future. And she had allies, Patrick Murphy Mellon, who becomes head of the ACLU subsequently. But he's really a vigorous visionary, and he's going to be there. And, um, and, she, and she also criticizes Breckenridge Long from the very beginning. Why don't you fire him? Because his goal is delay, delay, delay. That's what in the film. He doesn't want one refugee here, not one. 
And she said, he's a fascist, friend, and you know he is. And, and FDR says, Eleanor, I told you not to use that word. Use <laughs> that word, but he is. And that's a great mystery. Why didn't he fire Breckenridge Long? And that takes us all the way after the Kwanzaa, all the way to 1944, when Henry Morgenthau's Treasury Department has that incredible, you know, finding the U.S. complicity in the final solution. And finally, there is the War Refugee Board. And Eleanor Roosevelt works very closely with Henry Morgenthau. And she and Eleanor Morgenthau go visit the camp in Oswego with Ruth Gluba, Ruth Gluba presenting. You know, and it's horrible. The camp. Oh, right. yeah. Okay, no, no, well, no, just a quick in a side note, yeah. just a little quick addition or addendum or something. In Breckenridge Long's war diary, what happened was I was reading it, and Breckenridge Long was on a little vacation for a week. And that's when Patrick Murphy Malin went down to take care of the situation. And, you know, Breckenridge Long said, let a couple people off, but just not, six. just, yeah, six. Six. I think it was six. Yeah, he committed to a handful of people. And Patrick Murphy Malin was like, I can't do that. I have to let these people off. And he was an amazing guy, very much of an unsung hero, very hard to track down any of his family to really mm -hmm. like talk about it. Or, point is, Breckenridge Long was infuriated. Well, you saw that in the film. He was infuriated that he had done that. But thank God he did, because Annette's here. FDR, who's in charge here? Me or your wife? If I'm in charge, this will never happen again. And FDR says, OK. And it didn't. And it didn't. Yeah. I mean, and that's the crazy thing, which is why Eleanor Roosevelt saw the Kwanzaa as a defeat. Yeah. Because it's after that that yeah. Breaking the Dawn is given total power to stop everything. And in volume three, in all the modesty, I urge you to read it. I was looking through through it because of this panel, and there it is. I'm sorry. It's in volume three, all of the efforts to get in 1943, Eleanor Rose, I mean, there's the white woes, you know, the anti germ the friends of German freedom, the German friends. And Eleanor Roosevelt is part of a network um, for which the FBI attacked so viciously. Um, but it's here, the unwanted. Okay, Laura, tell us a little bit about your research. Um, I mean, you probably didn't know all that much about the Kwanzaa before you embarked on this project. Yeah. And then suddenly you started gathering all this material. Tell us about how you gathered the material, particularly some of the, that visual material. Um, and what most surprised you in the course of your research? Okay, yeah, I mean, that's a lot to unpack, but cause it, I have worked on it for a little while. Um, but I, I just want to tell you that, so I'm from Newport News, Virginia, where the lawyer was from, and there's a few Newport News or Norfolk or, you know, Tiger people in the audience. Um, I know my cousins are in the audience somewhere. But, look back there. Um, this story was so little known. It's just fascinating to me because you really would think that people would be so proud in my hometown of this story, but it was so hush hush. And one reason, one reason I can just sort of attribute to it is they were afraid. They were Southern Jews who just didn't want to talk. And honestly, this guy J. L. Morowitz, he's a distant cousin of mine. He's a great uncle of mine. I didn't know this part of my family very well at all until his grandson, Stephen Morwitz, who came up and spoke earlier, came to me and brought this story to my attention about producing this film. And um, people, you know, just felt, I think at the time, like, oh my gosh, this guy's, like, you know, just so out there. We gotta be out there. That's the thing, like, we gotta be out there and stand up for what we believe in and be a little outside the box, and when we see a refugee who needs help or someone who needs help, 
we got to do things about it and make ourselves a little uncomfortable. I think he made himself a little uncomfortable. God knows Patrick, I mean, um, Sosa Mendes made himself uncomfortable. I mean, wow. He, I mean, as, as you, many of you know in, in the film, he saved upwards of 30,000 people. I think it was 12,000 of them approximately were Jews. But God, he, I think he died a pauper, right? I mean, he died a pauper. He, he risked everything. He risked his life. He risked his family. So I just think that that's a real lesson to be thought about where, what are we doing? And it's hard on, you know, I sometimes think about that too. I mean, yes, I'm a documentary filmmaker. I'm telling the story. That's great. But then what, am, what else am I doing? And I think we all need to be asking that to ourselves. You know, asking that. So, okay, answer your question. Um, not completely, but we can come back to it perhaps. Um, Kathy, um, so we talked about um, your father and um, his uh, escape on the Kwanzaa. And you told me that his, your father didn't really ever talk about this. Um, and I was wondering, you know, why didn't he talk about it? And then later you tried to reconstruct the story. How did you go about reconstructing it? Well, he um, was a very quiet man, and he was almost embarrassed. He had tremendous survivor's guilt. Oops, why is this so loud? Um, and he had survivor's guilt his whole life. And um, the only way I was really able to reconstruct this entire story, he passed away in uh, 2000, at the age of 97. He lived, obviously, almost another 60 years. He was 36 years old when he was on the Kwanzaa. So he lived quite a long life. Um, and when I always asked him about how did he escape, and I tried to get stories out of him, didn't happen. And I said, well, didn't you have a passport? And he said, oh, no, no, I didn't have a passport. Well, it turns out when he passed away in 2000, I was looking at his papers. And lo and behold, there was a passport, of which I now actually have copies, which is great because Olivia uh, has the real one. And um, the idea was that uh, he just simply didn't want to be called a hero. And he, uh, I found out about this when I saw it, and my husband has a good friend who's a Holocaust uh, teacher in San Francisco, and he came down when I'd gotten the passport and he wanted to look at it. And I hadn't even really looked at it. And he was the one who um, found the signature on the page, and he said, doesn't that say Aristides de Sousa Mendes? And I'm like, guess what, it does. And we continued to flip through the passport, and actually on the last page of the passport, which is where I have a copy of it, not hardly visible, but um, it actually says, Norfolk, Virginia, September 14th, 1940, admitted as a bona fide political refugee. Arrived Norfolk, Virginia, September 11th, 1940, SS Kwanzaa. And it's signed, unfortunately, illegibly, by somebody who says, I think, an immigration ex inspector who must have been given the power to do the signature by uh, Patrick Murphy Mallet. Um, but so I found the passport, and then my husband's friend told me that I should contact the Susan Mendes Foundation. And I said, okay, don't know anything about it, but I'll do that. And I did, and discovered Olivia Mathis. And she was the one who pressed me, and we got on the whole thing, and in fact, uh, we, my husband and I, went on the first uh, trip that the Susan Mendes Foundation sponsored called the, um, let's see, where, I never remember, Journey on the Road to Freedom. It was the first one in June 2013. And um, we followed the footsteps of the refugees of 1940 through all of the stops that they made through France and Spain and Portugal. And we visited all the towns, including the first stop was Bordeaux, and we actually went, and it was an amazing experience. We actually walked into the building and climbed up the stairs that my father had actually walked up to get 
the visa. It was incredible. The experience, the feeling was amazing. I don't even know how I survived it because it was, I was crying the whole way. It was pretty amazing. Um, okay, just to be clear, that visa, what did it allow him to do? Uh, he, was, he got it in Bordeaux. He got it in Bordeaux and it what? allowed him to go to Lisbon. Um, unfortunately, let's see, where's the page? Um, the, unfortunately, these signatures are very, very hard to read and the stamps are hard to read. But um, it allowed him to go to Portugal and from where he hoped to be able to get on a ship, which turned out to be the uh, La Quanza. Right. Um, but it didn't specify, it just said you can get to Lisbon. Right. So, um, but yeah, it was, uh, that's what I did. And I, following the trip on the journey of the road to freedom was just amazing. So, Annette, so, I mean, your family, they've probably been wanting to get to the U.S., haven't they? Um, what, uh, had they, I mean, we all heard about these quotas that there were, you had to, uh, you had to apply for a place underneath the quota, and um, different countries had different quotas. There's the German quota, there was the Polish quota, there was the Belgian quota. Under the U.S. immigration law of the time, each country was accorded a quota for its citizens. Now, why was it so difficult for your family to get a US immigration visa that forced them to look for a different solution? Well, uh, my parents were not Belgian citizens. They were Polish citizens. And there was a quota on Polish citizens. And so they had, they could not get uh, a visa to, I mean, a regular visa for the U.S. And so they had to resort. I mean, my father just got a, uh, a uh, visitor's visa for work in, uh, in, for the U.S. It was only temporary. But um, we had to go to other sources, like the Italian uh, consulate. And they were fascists. And they, you know, I guess they gave us these visas for Mexicans. That's the best we could do. Yeah, this is something that I discovered during the course of my research uh, into this village in Germany, that actually the German quota was quite generous. 27,000 uh, Germans were allowed to immigrate to the United States every year. But the quota for East Europeans, including East European Jews uh, and Polish Jews, was much uh, smaller, and so it was much more difficult, perhaps 10 times more difficult, for a Polish Jew to immigrate to the United States as it was for a German Jew. Um, so many of the people on the Kwanzaa were probably not even German Jews, they were uh, Jews of a different uh, nationality. Uh, Stan. So it's now 4.30 and um, I think we've had a very thorough discussion. Thank you very much for coming.